Okay, it is 9.30 and um, we always like to start in time and so we can get you um, out in time. So um, if you haven't gotten your coffee uh, and stuff, go ahead and get that and um, find a seat. Welcome to our first uh, parent forum meeting of the, of the new school year. Um, I always like to go over the ground rules and the norms for the meeting. Um, as you all know, these are televised, um, uh, so they will be up on the internet later. And so because of that, we, Ray and Lori will be walking around with these hand mics. So please, uh, if you're going to ask a question, wait till they come to you so that you can um, speak into that so that the viewers can hear us. Um, one of the norms that we have here is that um, the, uh, these are public meetings and we want to make sure that we respect everyone's opinions. So um, uh, the great thing that we have in our nation is that we can have um, separate thoughts, um, but we just have to respect and be um, uh, uh, kind to one another. That's a really important piece. The other norm that we have here is that these meetings are general big district topics. So um, it's not a meeting where uh, if you're mad at the, your child's teacher or you're mad at the child's principal, um, uh, we speak that publicly. I will always stay after and, and talk about that personally um, uh, for that. And we, another norm that we do is we always go around and introduce ourselves and say um, who we are and what school or schools that we may be representing, okay? So, but uh, before we do that, I think in the future what I'm gonna do, um, because this is like church, nobody sits up front, you know, you know, you know, everyone fills the back first and then goes this way. So I think what we'll do is we'll do some type of incentive uh, reward system for those who come to the front because you know what, it's, it's okay. So the, uh, um, but so we'll start here if, uh, on this side and then Lori, uh, if you're gonna start and go this way, great, thanks. Uh, my name is Marcello Sawyer. Uh, my son goes to Madison Elementary. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jordan Tracy and I have a daughter at Cabrilli K through eight. Felton Williams, uh, president of the board. Diana Craighead, Board of Education. Uh, good morning. My name is Robert Collins. My son goes to Tensher Elementary. Just. Hi, my name is Karen Wolf, and I represent Adams Elementary. Good morning. I'm Tanisha Pitts, and I'm representing Hughes, Polly, and Wilson. <laughs> Liz Bennett, and I have kids at Cleveland, Bancroft, and Milliken. I'm Terry Jameson, and I have grandsons at Marshall Academy of the Arts. Good morning. I'm Monique Ray. I have students at Colin Powell and Jordan High School. Jim Martin. I have a son at uh, Hughes and a daughter at Milliken. Aloha, everyone. Um, my name is Malaya Fipuleai to Omalatai Coleman. I'm the Pacific Island Education Voyage um, founder. Uh, and I'm here to represent the Pacific Islander community in Long Beach Unified School District. I'm Rick Durantine. I have uh, two granddaughters at Rogers and a daughter at Stanford. She's the principal. <laughs> Eldora Smith Baker. I have a freshman at Milliken. Good morning. I have students at Rogers, Wilson, and Sato. I'm representing Sato. Hi, I'm Rebecca Fast. I work in Parent University, and I have two daughters at Keller. Good morning. Um, I'm Dasha. I have twins. One is at McBride, and I'm representing McBride, and I have the other one at Milliken, and they're seniors. Yay! <laughs> Good morning. My name is Elsa Acosta, and I have two children. One is Stanford, and I represent Emerson. Good morning, my name's Kimberly. I have three kids, one at Bixby, one at Emerson, and one at Stanford, and I'm representing Emerson. Hi, good morning, my name is Marta. I have two twins in Emerson and one child in, uh, in Stanford. Hello, good morning, my name is Dewi Valerdi. I have two daughters in elementary heart. Good morning, my name is Gloria Rualcava. I am a district interpreter. And we have translation for anyone that wants it, or needs it. Good morning, I'm Megan Kerr. I'm on the Board of Education. Good morning, I'm Ruth Ashley, Deputy Superintendent of Education Services. 
both of my children also graduated from Long Beach schools. Good morning, my name is Kelly Hodge. I work in the Office of Equity and Access, and I have a son who graduated from Poly in 2011. Uh, good morning, my name is Maria Loesa. I have two daughters, and one is in Bancroft Middle School, and the other is in Signa Hill Elementary, and I represent them both. Good morning, my name is Erika Leos. I'm representing Bancroft and Dooley Elementary. Hello, my name is Clemencia Crespa. I represent Cabrillo High School in Garfield Elementary. Hi, my name is Paula Murphy. I represent Cabrillo High School and Stevens Middle School. Good morning, my name is Jennifer Castro and I have two students at Tinsher K-8. Good morning, my name is Nade Prank. I am representing Nelson. I have a child that goes to Nelson. Thank you. And my name is Lori. I'm the superintendent's secretary, and I had two boys that graduated from Long Beach Unified. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Chris Itz, and I'm the administrative assistant for Ed Services. Um, and I have a three-year-old, so we're not quite there yet, but she will be a product of Long Beach Unified. <laughs> Thank you, and Chris is gonna be one of our um, presenters uh, later today. So um, if you just look at the agenda real quickly, um, Chris is gonna talk. Um, he uh, is a fantastic person, and he has a new role uh, this year. And he's going to be talking about social media in, in the district, and he's really been focusing on, on two big pieces. One is the system-wide piece of social media, as well as meeting with our high school students and, 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 and their role. Then um, we'll talk about the section process for the new superintendent, and then um, some uh, um, budget issues that we, 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 we are from leftover from last time. And then um, just a couple of announcements. Um, we uh, have three schools that just became California Distinguished Schools. They'll be honored uh, on February 10th, which is a holiday, so those uh, um, wonderful souls will be at Disneyland on their day off. Um, the, uh, that's where they hold the, the dinner. Uh, and so it's Twain Elementary School, Alvarado Elementary School, and Lafayette, Lafayette Elementary School. We're very excited. Another one, um, if you go to School Choice on January 25th, you'll hear of a new program um, uh, uh, that will be started for our um, dual immersion program. As you know, we have a very strong dual immersion program. Uh, Bixby was our newest school that's in dual immersion, and Bixby is K-1 dual immersion. And at Bixby and at Henry, those are what we call um, uh, full sites. So for example, at Henry, all the students are in dual immersion. All 900 students are in dual immersion program. At Bixby, all kindergarten students, all 120 are. So eventually Bixby will be 100% um, dual immersion. Willard, Lafayette, Webster are um, what we call um, dual immersion strands. So they either have two or three classes in kindergarten and all the way up, uh, so on. And then as you all know, Keller Middle School is a, a completely 100% dual immersion, grades six, seven, and eight. And then Chavez will be our newest addition to the dual immersion program and they'll be adding two classes uh, in kindergarten next year so they'll have two classes uh, for english and two classes for um, dual immersion so you'll if you go to the, the celebration program you'll, you'll you'll hear about that and then we'll have some other announcements but i want to uh, introduce chris um, hold on to your hats you're going to be greatly involved he's a wonderful person and um, i can't thank him enough for um taking on this role because there was no job description, okay? So we said, hey, you, you get to design it. And Mrs. Ashley um, is, is his um, evaluator. So he's gonna be, he's on extra good behavior today. So just like I am, because I have three of my bosses here today. So, so, so it's all yours, sir. Good morning, everyone. So I have to warn you, I talk really fast. I'm gonna do my absolute best to slow down, but especially when I get excited talking about the great things we're doing, I just get motor mouth. So, you know, you can give me that weird look or nod if you're like, hey, slow down, calm down as we're going. So, like I said. So, 
Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Uh, my wife this morning on the way in texted me and said, talk in slow motion. Make sure you talk in slow motion, so I'm going to do my best. Um, so very, very excited to be here today um, to talk to you about some great things that we're doing. We're innovating as a district in ways that almost no one in the country is doing. Um, and so before I share that, I want to I let you know a little bit about myself. Um, I was an English and a social science teacher at Millican High School and then at Cabrillo High School um, and also the activities director. And um, one of the big great things that I loved about my job was I got to be a storyteller and I got to engage students in telling stories, right, and especially in English and social science, and just the, the, the excitement of us talking about who we are and who we are as, as in culture and everything like that. And so now I have this amazing job where I get to help tell our story as a district and help our sites tell their stories of who our community is. And it's really, really exciting work. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing for the last six months and then where we're going. And then I'm going to end today um, with some information for you as parents um, when we talk about safety um, on social media for our students so that you're aware of some of the pitfalls and then some of the positives as well, as well of social media. So before we get started, I want to test the room a little bit and then I have a little quiz for you. So we're going to do a thumbs up, thumbs middle, thumbs down activity. Very, very easy, not too hard because um, it's early. So thumbs up, you're all about social media, you use it all the time or you're comfortable with it, you're good. Thumb in the middle, you're like, uh, I use it sometimes. I have that Facebook account that I check every once in a while, but I, I don't know. And then thumbs down, I'm terrified of social media. Or I just don't want anything to do with it. Go for it. Okay, okay. All right, thank you very much. All right, perfect. So a lot of, I saw a lot of middle, right? A lot of middle like, yeah, we're into it and stuff. Um, so the, we're going to talk about the realities of social media and why it matters, even if you don't want anything to do with it. It still matters, and so here's why. So before we start, let's take a little quiz. So this is going to be a little tabletop quiz um, with the partners at your table. Um, you're going to kind of brainstorm together. Very simple. They're not difficult questions. Um, you're not graded on this. First question is, what are the two most used social media platforms for ages 35 and up? So don't shout it out. Talk to your tables first. 35 and up. Okay, let me bring you back together. I'm using my teacher trick. I'll put my hand up. Every time I put my hand up, and getting everybody to, to come back together. All right, so what do we think? Facebook. Who, who's, who also said Facebook? Raise your hand. Okay. Ding, 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 you are correct. Facebook has about 2.51 billion active users. It is the largest social media platform, hands down, across the globe. What's the other one for this age group? Twitter, Twitter is close, but no. Instagram is also climbing, but no. This is the trick. This one's a little bit of a trick. I'm sorry, I do this with the kids, too, when I present, and, and they, it always takes a long time. So I'll give you a hint. This one, you... You don't necessarily have to have a social media presence. You can engage with it and get a lot of entertainment value from it. YouTube, YouTube, right? And YouTube. <laughs> All right, stay with me, stay with me. And YouTube is, um, it's a little bit harder to track because you don't have to have an account to use YouTube, right? Like I don't have an account. I just watch videos and stuff. So massive use. All right, so great job. Second question, very similar but we're gonna switch age groups. So what are the two most used social media platforms for ages 13 to 25? All right, let's come back together. What did we come up with? Instagram. I heard, who all said Instagram? Okay. I heard TikTok. I've, you've heard of TikTok? Snapchat. It is Instagram and YouTube. Um, Instagram has been dramatically climbing, especially in the last two years. Um, and then YouTube is just the dominant platform overall in entertainment value. Snapchat, TikTok, and Twitter are close behind, and those are active users. TikTok is exploding right now, right? It's, it's 
Uh, it's kind of scary. Make sure that you are checking TikTok because it's something to be aware of, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, the reason Instagram is really kind of exploding with this generation is, if you're not aware, Facebook buys everything. So they bought Snapchat, and they bought Instagram, and they own it now. And Snapchat was this really popular thing because it was these videos that would disappear, and they were fast little clips. So Mark Zuckerberg was a genius and said, I'm going to make a one-stop shop platform. So you look at Instagram, it has these beautiful visuals. You can put a ton of text. You also have this live feature, and you have a Snapchat filters and all those kind of features. And it's not as clunky and web-based as Facebook. And so it's really kind of your one-stop shop. And so we're seeing that students and young people are really uh, gleaming onto this platform. All right. So... Let's talk about the purpose of, of, of what I do and what my office works on. So really trying to maintain a social media platform that really has three goals this year. And the first one is to recognize the ever-growing impact of social media on our society and pioneering new, pioneering new ways um, to safely maximize its potential for how we enhance our communication, our culture and climate, um, and really academic success. 46% um, of the world's population is on social media. Think of that number of the eight or so billion people there are, right? It is, it is a reality now. It's not going anywhere. It's growing. It's massive. We have to get our, our hands around it as a community, as educators, as parents, to understand that this is the, uh, the reality. Um, and so it's something that we, we, as a district, are kind of pioneering and innovating and looking at is how do we access this technology to safely use it uh, for benefits, but also to protect our students. And the second piece is the storytelling piece, spreading the message that LBUSD is a leader in urban education. We have so many amazing things going on. I, the most exciting part of my job is monitoring social media and then going out to our tons of sites and just seeing the great things our teachers are doing, our students are doing, all the access to technology, all the great programs we have. You hear a lot in the media about the negative side of education all the time. You don't hear about the thousands and thousands of great things are happening. Social media is a way to do that in real time. Um, this morning I posted, I think I posted 12 different posts about different awesome things happening just in the last two days, right? And that was just very quickly on the way in, into work today. Um, not while I was driving, I promise. Uh, <laughs> um, and then lastly is to provide all of our sites, our departments, our stakeholders with a structure for safely using this technology. Making sure that our staff have appropriate rules, that we're protecting our students, that we're protecting the privacy of everyone, and really making sure that everybody is on the same page with that. So this is kind of our three pieces that we've been working on since the beginning of this year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the hub does. So the social media hub is, is out of our education services office, and this is how we, we are using the technology. And then I'll talk about how we are supporting our sites. So one of the things that we've just developed is our administrative regulation, which is uh, connected to our board policy, the Code of Ethics board policy. And our administrative regulation is the rules for our teachers and our staff, all of our staff to have to safely utilize this technology, making sure that we have photo releases for students, that we're protecting privacy rights, that we're following all of our other board policies that connect with social media. And so being clear about what the rules are and how to safely use the technology. Um, we are very, very excited. In the next probably month, we are starting a, a podcast series where we are going to dig deep into the stories of the great things happening in our district, but then also we're going to start with something called the Principal Project, and we're going to look at interview six different principals that are really leading our charge for closing the achievement gap and for equity work in our district. There's some amazing people who have done some awesome stuff and led their, their, their teams. We want to share that with the community. Um, we have the YouTube broadcast, which is happening right now, right? Our Office of Multimedia Services does an excellent job of broadcasting our board meetings, the parent workshops, parent university, and other items so that people have access to it. And the great thing about that, I, I shared this at a presentation the other day, um, we had a board meeting where we had a parent university uh, session, and there were 50 attendees there. Nice turnout. There was 2,000 people watching it at the same time. So the access for YouTube to allow us to get, you know, you're at home or you're at work and you can't get to a meeting, now you have that opportunity to access it. And then from there, it's archived. So then you, you see something great, you know, a great uh, uh, presentation or some information that you think your, your friends or family need to know about, it's archived, they can go back and watch it after it's live. So it's a nice functional communication piece. And then from there, um, media showcasing our student life and accomplishments. So creating videos and little clips that we're putting on our Instagram and our Facebook and our YouTube, showcasing some of the awesome things that are happening. Um, and so then also don't forget to follow us at Twitter, at LB Schools, and Instagram, at Long Beach USD, and Facebook, Long Beach Unified School District, if you're not. And so then this is, this is something that we do to try to engage and connect with our staff community, but also with, with our entire community, is each day of the week we run a hashtag. So raise your hand if you know what a hashtag is. All right, raise your hand if you're like, I have no idea what a hashtag is. 
All right, perfect. So a hashtag, it's like the little number sign, um, and you, you, when you type that little number sign in and then you add a word or a phrase all in one word, it indexes that so that if you search that hashtag, you will find it. Uh, anybody who has posted that anywhere online, it'll show up, and so it links that with other people doing the same thing. Our dominant hashtag in Long Beach is proud to be LBUSD. That's, that's the one that we use all the time. So if you search hashtag proud to be LBUSD on Twitter or Instagram, you'll find tons and tons of great posts, not only from our hub, but from across the district. Um, so each day of the week we do, we do these different hashtags. Motivational Monday is just you know, sharing a motivational quote. Inclusion Tuesday is really about equity and how are we doing, what are we doing to really support all of our students and the all, all means all campaign. My Why Wednesday is about our staff talking about why they engage in, in educational work to serve students. Um, my favorite, the most exciting, is our TB Thursday. And the first time I said this to our public information office, uh, officer, I said, it's gonna be TB Thursday. He's like, TB Thursday, what, what does that mean? It's throwback Thursday, right? And so it's going back. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the 134 years of our district's history and showcasing it. So this morning we posted a post from 1976. Um, the very first post we did was my, my favorite. It was Grace Bush. She was the first teacher in Long Beach. She was 16 years old, high school graduate who taught for three months in a borrowed tent for $75. And so we kind of started that campaign really showcasing her as our first teacher. And then Featured Friday, we showcase other accounts across the district so that, that they build their following base. Saturday is sustaining self-care, really talking about health and wellness and how important that is for us as educators to maintain our health so that we can support your, your children. And then a new one that we're doing starting now is Census Sunday and really promoting why the census is so important and working with the city government and, and state and federal governments to really promote that. And so each day, each day of the week, we just engage a little bit on social media to try to get people to connect and, and have some dialogue. And then some other things we're doing is interacting and reposting official posts from our LBSD account. So anytime our transportation department has some information or th this morning our school, uh, our campus security, they're, um, they're hiring right now and so they had a flyer out. So we, we repost those things out. So information to the public. So we're just another layer um, of, pr of pr providing information that's coming from the sites. And then um, building our own following base so that we can really broadcast who we are to our community and then beyond. Yes. So are all of these say you only use one platform, like Instagram. So are all of these going to be on each platform, or are they filtered by platform? Like, that's a great question. So they are. It's it's a little bit of both. So for example, hashtags don't work on Facebook. People still put them. I put them on Facebook, but they don't actually index. Uh, Instagram and Twitter, they do the majority of that content goes on every single platform. So like I was tell telling you, Facebook and Instagram are the same company. They have, they have a, linked, uh, a linked option, right? So every time we post on Twitter, it automatically, or Instagram, it automatically goes to Facebook. So it's on there all the time. Um, but Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube are our dominant platforms. We don't engage in the other platforms. That's a great question. Um, so then also, we want to talk about, that's how we curate, that's all, all the stuff that we do from the hub, but then we want to talk about what's happening at the sites. And so that's about supporting our sites and safely managing social media um, to market to their district stakeholders and sharing their success. So from the hub, we're communicating to as many people as we can. But at Emerson, they want to communicate to their stakeholders, right, and their community of students and parents and families that are there. And so first, developing the administrative regulation, um, and then starting with the high schools, and this took uh, a lot of traveling, but we went out to every single one of our high schools and met with them and helped develop a team um, to start creating account registry. So if you go on um, Instagram right now and you type in, especially at the high schools, um, you type in Milliken, you're gonna find 30, 40, 50 different accounts from their football team to their golf team to their art club to their AP uh, classes. You're going to have all these accounts. And so what we're doing is having the administrators create a registry so that they, they know who are their official accounts and what's happening so they can monitor the messages that's coming out from all of those different entities because it's a ton. And so we're really grappling with getting hold of that and making sure that we have this account registry that we know who is sharing out there about LBUSD in an official capacity. Um, and then from there, um, providing, question? Several different accounts, like is there actually a, a staff member who runs, like say wrestling at Milliken? It's not a child or a student who runs that account who are in charge, it's a staff member? Yes, that's, that's what we're making sure right now. I, I can't tell you 100% right now because anybody can make a social media account. So that's been a big part of this work is going out and saying, hey, I, I spent probably two months, uh, myself and my intern, just searching and scouring social media and finding any account that had any name of any of our schools and then created a database and then went to those schools and said, hey, 
all these accounts are using your name. Do you know who's on these accounts? And now they're putting that together and making sure that adults are monitoring that social media. That doesn't mean that there aren't times where students are involved in that process and monitored. So for example, when I was activities director at Cabrillo, I had a social media intern student who I trained and monitored. Now I looked at it every single part of the day and made sure that it was appropriate, but we engaged them in that work as well because kids, they know this better than we do. So if they're using it safely, they have some awesome ideas because they, they've only existed in this with this technology. So from there, um, developing that registry, and then the next thing we're doing is we're starting with the high schools, going out to the student councils and the different leadership programs and meeting with the students as focus groups and training them as digital citizenship leaders. So how are they promoting their schools? How are they using their social media to not just share their cool videos about what they did on the weekend, but sharing their successes and sharing what their sites are doing. So they're part of that, that process as well. Um, and they will be part of our podcast also. And then working with our site designee, so that's the administrator that's over social media for each site in monitoring social media. So if I see something that we find inappropriate on social media, we can let that school know, hey, this account at your school has this on here, or there's a situation going on. So everybody's aware. So trying to just have that transparency and monitoring as much as possible because it's, it moves so fast, right? It's, it's a constant, constant process. Um, and then uh, we're trying to provide more resources and information. So we developed a social media guide. It's about 21 pages. That went out to all of of our staff about how to use this technology, the thinking around our kids and how social media impacts them and what they need to know. And now we're developing a parent social media guide and a student social media guide that are more tailored to different stakeholders. So that will be coming out oh, probably by the end of this year, we'll have that all kind of done. Yes. Can you confirm if elementary schools throughout Long Beach Unified um, have firewalls, especially at the elementary schools? When children are online researching in their Chromebooks, is there firewalls in the Chromebooks or in the system? I would say yes. I'm not part of that department. I don't run any of our technology, but. Yes, uh, you my mic off. Because of the restrictive firewalls, our kids couldn't do especially research and other things. So, so we took down some firewalls, but our IT department monitors that on a daily basis. So just like anything, like those people that try to do ransomware and all that kind of business, it's changing every second. So we really have to be ahead of it and, and folks are doing a good job. But the protection in, of our students is, is priority one. And on that point, from the social media side, we're constantly looking for imposters or negative accounts. So that, sadly, students will post um, images of fights or, or violence or different things, and they'll create an account that's just for that. And so we're constantly catching that, reporting that to the, so the social media companies and getting them taken down. Yes? Just a quick question. Like, you're talking about making fo focus groups to teach the kids and the staff how to um, appropriately um, put things up on social media regarding the schools. But is this going to then... Um, trickle down to teaching them how to do this on their own personal accounts because I know a lot of students have their own personal Facebook, Twitter, Instagram that's not associated with the school per se, but are we going to start teaching them, like you said, like social media citizenship and things like that and work or like in workshops for the parents so the parents will know what's going on with, you know for those that aren't on it at themselves so they can better kind of keep an eye on what their kids are doing? Absolutely, great question. Yes, and so I, I think I kind of misspoke when I was explaining because I talked so fast. Um, one of the things we've been doing when we got and, and met with the student leadership groups is talking about how they use their own personal social media in a benefit and the positives with that. And so we started kind of with student leaders at the high school level. It's such a massive system to tackle, so that's a big piece. We did do a parent workshop at Renaissance um, at the beginning of the year, and we're trying to expand that. Um, we've even gone out to Avalon and worked with all of their AVID classes and their leadership classes. So we're, we're getting to that. That's, that's definitely in the works. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. That's kind of where we're going for this part is now let's talk about why social media matters for you and your student. 
and some of the good and the bad. So um, this is not an exhaustive list. I could talk to you for seven hours on all of this information. This, this, the world of social media is so vast. Um, but here's just a few things to think about with social media. So some of the benefits, current research supports that social media actually provides inclusion for a lot of students who feel excluded. Um, there are online communities, right, of, uh, based on your belief system or your hobbies or whatever you're into, where students can find some connections. Um, I personally knew a student who, um, a college student, who lived in Kansas and based on her lifestyle and, and how she, her beliefs, she was very isolated from her very small community and felt very alone, dealt with thoughts of suicide and, and a lot of problems, but she found solace online by being able to connect with people across the globe that thought the way she did um, and then she ended up moving to California. Um, so the benefits, uh, so some of the benefits of that, of that inclusion of you can find community on social media. We always hear how terrible it is, but there also are also ways to connect with people. You know, even s silly things. I'm a big surfer. There's a huge surf community on social media, right? So I've connected with people all the time in that way. Um, it also can provide ex exposure to new ideas. Um, our kids today, you know, they, they, I, I have to defend our kids because you know, they get this bad moniker uh, in the media, right? Gen Z, and they, you know, they're, they can't interface, and, and their, their head's in the clouds, and they can't focus. They're all over the place. But they have more access to information in real time than anybody ever has in human history. Um, being at the high school level, which is my primary experience, just even in the last three years, seeing students engaging in um, political dialogue and discourse and social issues and starting these clubs, you're seeing kids become activists in their own right, and it's because they have access to learn about information. Now, we have to help them and teach them how to filter that information because th there's a lot of misinformation out there, but it's really great to see that kind of democratization of information, that it's in their hand and they can, they can learn on their own as well. Um, so that's some of the really good benefits. Some of the pitfalls, um, what's displayed on social media, right? There's a lot of inappropriate stuff displayed on social media, lifestyle things that um, cause our kids to have a lot of anxiety and pressure. Anxiety rates have skyrocketed in this country, and a lot of people think it has to do with social media. Some of the research shows that. So just that issue that it's reality. And I, I tell this story um, when I go out to the kids. Um, there was a student in another district who um, did not use social media at all, high school student. And they uh, had a flip phone still. Parents wouldn't let them use social media at all. They walk into class one morning, and as they're walking in, they feel this kind of weird vibe. Everyone's kind of looking at them and kind of snickering, and they're like, something's up, something's up. And they sit down in their desk, and class starts. And during the warm-up, their friend leans over and shows them their phone with a compromising video of this student changing in the locker room that somebody had taken without them knowing and put online. Now imagine being that child in that moment and knowing that thousands of people have seen this and how just devastating that is. And in the moment, the teacher thought that the two students were just messing around and not focusing, so kind of snapped at them, said, hey, you need to get back to work. It caused this confrontation. It got completely out of control. Um, student almost was expelled from the district, caused all these huge problems. This student didn't even use social media, but it still impacted their life, right? It's a reality. It's not going anywhere. It still touches our consciousness now as a society. Um, and then another pitfall is just that leading into that is cyberbullying, right? Cyberbullying can happen anywhere and any time of the day. It can happen in the middle of the night. It happened it happen when you walk into a classroom. It's always there, and that's a really scary thing um, to deal with. Yes? I actually had my first taste last week of this. I'm a thumb sideways, so I'm not super sophisticated. But I have, I think, you said your daughter is uh, Coverly? You're back here? Over here? I have a daughter. Oh, but uh, the principal over at Stanford? I thought so. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought someone said that because I got to speak to like three different principals because the cyberbullying took place at one school, but it went to another school and went to another school. But my question in that sense is, are we teaching kids like when they post online, like even if they're anonymous, people can find out. And like, you know, we've been doing like these little investigations. So I think this person who started a site thought they would be anonymous but they're not. And then I had a conversation with my son, like if you say the F word or something online, guess what, people are gonna see it. It's gonna get back to you. So are we having those kind of conversations with our kids, like you think you're kind of anonymous, but guess what, you are so not anonymous. Definitely. Definitely, it's not, and that's a huge piece. So one of the things as we've gone out to start doing this education and working with our student leader focus groups is that's how we start every dialogue. We start with first of the dangers of social media and their responsibility in using it. And it goes even beyond what they post, it's who they follow, who are they affiliated with? You know, What are they liking? What are they connecting with? Who are they engaging? And I tell them a story every time that um, one of our major industry partners that we work with, they have two full-time interns that when a job application is turned in, the first thing they do is they search you on social media. And if they find even 
the tiniest thing negative, your application goes to the bottom of the pile instantly, right? And when you tell the kids that, their eyes get giant and they're like, what? What about the stuff I posted in middle school? And you're like, yeah, it all will follow you. So you need to get on top of that now. And so we need to do more. We need to do more. But that's, that's part of this position is really getting to that work. And so another one of our next steps that wasn't listed on there is working with the curriculum office to start building embedded digital citizenship curriculum from K-12. You know, we can't do social media lessons in the 10th grade and do four lessons in an English class and say, okay, we taught them how to use it. They're great. They need to understand it from when they're very, very, very young, even before they're using it, the impact of that. And so that's in the works as we're going. And so with that, there's some statistics. Um, they're kind of hard to see on here, um, but a couple things just to know. Um, of ages 13 to 17 um, year old, when you talk about the percentage, how much they check social media, 27% do it hourly. Um, the average uh, young person is on social media. It's 40% of their day in some way, shape, or form, engaging, looking, connecting with, contacting, right? I mean, it's just part of their, their reality now. They live in this digital world that's there. Um, they're struggling with interfacing. Um, that's a big thing. We're seeing a trend of being able to talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one is becoming very difficult. Um, and then some students did talk about their, their uh, well-being actually raising by using social media, but then some, it, it raises their anxiety and does the opposite. And so it's kind of a mixed bag with it. But really, when we're using it safely, when we're using it appropriately to spread positivity, that tends to, to lower that anxiety. Um, so let's talk about your kids a little bit. So there's two pieces that, that um, when we were at Renaissance that we discussed with the parents, and it was safety and self-image and marketing for college and career. So the scary, but also the really good uh, benefits of social media. Um, so some things that to be aware of when it comes to safety is training your, your students not to post their location. Um, if you see Instagram especially, it has a little thing when you go to post, it says uh, add your location, it's a geolocator, so you just start typing in where you're at and it'll pop up, and then they post it like, oh, I'm at the Exchange, or I'm at Long Beach Unified. Um, that's dangerous, right? That, if somebody is stalking them online, now they know where they are all the time, right? And so really being careful about posting your location. Um, it's not a fast rule, but it's, it's, it's a, a good rule to follow. Um, and really helping them watch the clock. I always do this joke when I talk to students, I go, how many of you, you have that big paper to write or that homework assignment, and you sit down and you're so stressed about it and then you check your social media real quick and then you're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and three hours go by and you're still on there and they all agree every single one of them I do that all the time right and I unfortunately do that too um, and so so really watching the clock and getting them to understand that that's gonna raise their anxiety it's gonna keep them from being productive um, it's, it's, it's just a negative thing and then also ask which apps and sites are popular with your teens friends um, ask or young or as they get into social media if, if you have really young kids but asking them what are you guys using so as the person who oversees social media in the district I didn't know what TikTok was until the third school that I visited this year the kids all told me about it and I was like tick what is this so I downloaded it immediately started researching what it was it freaked me out um, but really just asking them you know they'll be honest about what's going on they know the trends they'll tell you why we're using certain platforms and what they're there um, and then also share what you're using um, you know, it's all of our job to model responsible use of, of social media and how, how we're showcasing that. And so letting your kids know that you're using this. Um, you know, I, as my daughter gets older, I don't engage in political fights online or argue with people or heckle, heckle people. I want to teach her to not do that as well and model that behavior for her. So then also think about uh, your online, with your kids, telling them to think about their online reputation, which we've kind of already talked about, who they're following, what they're putting in their posts, um, what, who they're liking, who they're interacting with, being careful because it does follow them wherever they go. And they need to aware that it's, it's a digital uh, fingerprint that's gonna keep coming back. Um, and then anything they create or communicate can be cut, altered, pasted, and sent around. Right? And so this is a dangerous thing now, right? You can post something and someone can take it and Photoshop it and mess with it. Have you all heard of deep fakes? Anybody heard deep fakes? It's really scary. I don't mean to scare you, but um, it's, it's very difficult to do. It's not, not uh, the everyday person can't do it, but people who are really adept at video technology now can take you talking and then put somebody else's words on it and alter it so it looks like you're fully saying something that you're not saying at all. Um, there's actually laws being passed to attack it in California because it's such a major issue that's gonna get worse and worse. So just being careful of what they post and who they're following. Um, I always tell students, keep your social media accounts private. Um, you know, personally for me, I run the district social media accounts that are public and open access. I have my own small Instagram. It's private. The only people that I allow to follow my account are people that I'm friends with or family or I'm close with. If the random person from 
who knows where is like, I want to follow you. I, I don't know you. You're not part of my circle. Sorry, it's not going to happen. Um, and so really, that, and then teaching them to avoid that drama, teaching them to not get involved in that. I mean, it's so easy to go through social media and see people arguing or debating and get mixed into that and be the, the digital keyboard warrior, you know, behind the keyboard, spreading, spreading your opinion. It just, it just causes negativity. So getting them to be aware that it's going to follow them, but also it's just not good for your health. Yes. wonderful guest speaker from Sioux Casa Youth Shelter, um, is um, Pamela Sepulveda. Her primary uh, reason to be there last night was to talk about the frontal lobe <laughs> and the development of the brain and how our young people don't have that fully developed until much later. So I think that with social media and the technology is going so fast, that the way I see it is that, in my opinion, we just don't have that maturity developed yet in order to make that sound good judgment decisions. I, for one, started on Facebook, and by the time, about two weeks later, I said, no more, because it's true. I was, in one sitting, I was there for four hours, and I said, you know what, I'm not gonna do this to my personal well-being, but I'm almost 50, so. <laughs> but I could only imagine, like, I truly appreciate it and I hope that we are able to transmit this information pronto because it is impacting in a positive but yet negative way and I've seen it with our young people in order to not have them reach their potential in their academic um, journey. So I appreciate this information. Absolutely, thank you for that comment. And you're right, and that's and that's kind of the heart of uh, the conversations we had before we, we really engaged in this work over the summer was that it's not going anywhere, it's scary, so what are we gonna do about it? You know, where are we gonna, we, we can't ignore it, it's there, it's a reality, so where do we go? Um, you know, as a person who runs all this, my three-year-old is not on screens. I don't let her use iPads and all that kind of stuff, it's just my personal opinion as, as somebody, but this is what I do for a living. I'm in the social media world, but I, I just, I want her to slowly get into that. But it's so scary because she knows what an iPad is. She saw mine one day and goes, can I see your iPad? And I'm like, How? I didn't tell you what that was, you know? So it, it's that reality, and so we have to get a hold of it. Question? Can I push back a little bit? Sure. Just in terms of, like, political discussions, because I know some people, like, they hate that on Facebook. I was a history teacher. I love history. I love politics. I love a good uh, political or historical argument. You know, of course, the key is being respectful, point of view. So I don't think necessarily it's going to be like drama. For some people, it's, you know, it, just like I think we need to engage, for some of us, in political uh, conversations face to face. That, that's a good thing too, as long as it stays on a certain level. So I'm not a, you know, no political arguments on Facebook or something. I think sometimes it's very appropriate. Absolutely, you're totally right. And I'll give you a great example. There's a, a, a AP history teacher in the district that you, has a public account that they use that they, they post uh, content and questions about historical concepts that they're teaching. And the students go back and forth and have that, a discussion, a debate, you know, not a fight, you know, and that difference where we've, we've kind of lost that in our political discourse in this country now where it's really about our emotions instead of are we critically thinking. And so they've used it as a teaching tool. And I think that's the point is how do we model that appropriate way to do that? Because you're right, it allows us to communicate with more people and have those discussions. So here's some good stuff too. When, you're, when your students, if they're not quite to high school yet, they're getting there, um, to just to kind of think about, but promotion and marketing for college and career. This is now a digital portfolio, right? Just as much as it can follow you negatively in social media, it can be positive. So like one of the things that we, we've been working with the students on is every time they win an award, they go do some amazing activity with an industry partner, they work on a project, they're posting that and putting that online. Because just as much as when they go for that college interview or they go for that job interview and they have their resume and everything, when they get searched and somebody sees in there, wow, look at all these accomplishments, look at the things the student was engaged in, look at the social interaction they have that's positive, that's marketing them. They actually can market themselves. We live in a world now where you don't need marketing companies and corporations to get your message out. Um, I always tell the kids a funny story about uh, when MySpace, everybody remember MySpace? MySpace was around for a little bit. Um, 
I thought I was going to be a rock star musician and MySpace came out and I could record my own album on my, on my Mac and I did it and then I posted it and I put it out there and I was terrible so I didn't go anywhere. But I got like six or seven shows out of it and stuff and that was an easy way to market. And I actually have a, a, a friend who's in a band, I'm not going to mention them, um, but they're very famous and they did all their own marketing through social media and actually they tour all over the world and they're doing South by Southwest this year and a bunch of great stuff. So, and that's a musical example, but you can, right? You can market yourself and talk about who you are in social media. And so really teaching the students, um, make it a professional profile, their image, their email, right? That's one thing we've been tackling for the last several years, but teaching students that make sure you have an appropriate email, like your name on your email, and same thing on your social media. Um, your bio should be your elevator pitch. Who knows what an elevator pitch is? Can someone tell me? Anybody want to summarize it? So it take whatever time it takes to go from ground floor to fifth floor is the time you have to make your pitch. Perfect. Thank you. Right. So it's that little synopsis that's very quick of just who are you and what are you about, right? And and can you do that very fast in that small amount of space? Um, follow the schools and industries you're interested in, getting them to understand they want to go to USC. They should be following every single account for USC and knowing what's happening. Um, I'm not promoting USC. I'm just to give it an example. Um, and then um, what you post and endorse matters. So and I brought that up in the beginning. What they're liking, what they're con who they're following, that really matters. You can go on anybody's social media page um, if they're not private and you can see who they're following or who follows them. So really knowing who are they associated with. Um, and then it's a springboard for research and immense learning potential. Um, it's kind of the same thing like Wikipedia. When Wikipedia came out, everyone, ah, Wikipedia teachers were like, it's terrible. And Wikipedia has its issues, but you can start there and then you can look at the sources on Wikipedia and you can go farther and explore. Same thing with social media. You find out about something that's happening, information that you want, and then you can go further and use that as a springboard. And then LinkedIn is another great social media platform. You have to be 16 or older to use it, but that's uh, in the professional world. Anybody have a LinkedIn? Right, a few people have LinkedIn here. Right, so that's another professional profile that they can start building and making contacts and networking now. Um, and so things to watch out for, just a few other things to be careful of as we're finishing up here, and I'll, then I'll take some questions. Um, look out for Finsta and spam accounts. Anybody know what a Finsta account is? Thank you, fake Instagram, right? And so what students will do, and sorry for the students that might see this, I'm gonna rat on them. Um, they might make their own social media account and tell mom and dad, this is my account and, it, and this is the only one I use. And then they have a totally fake account that they're using to engage in who knows what. Spam account is another term that's used for that as well, that they have their spam account. Um, TikTok, Instagram stories, uh, and then on Snapchat, really getting the students to understand, they think that those videos disappear. They do, but that doesn't mean somebody can't data mine and find that. Or the easiest thing is to screenshot it, right? You just push two little buttons on your phone and screenshot. And so quick funny story on that. I was out at a dinner with some of my friends who are teachers within Long Beach Unified. And I, it's, it's a group of guys. We go out probably like once a month. But we've all had kids in the last few years. And so not everyone's always there. Somebody's usually missing. And I didn't go for like six months. And Everybody's together, the whole team's there, all five of us, I'm so excited, all my friends are there, and I take a picture real quick, appropriate picture, we're just sitting at dinner, but I take a picture of us and I, and I write, um, the whole starting lineup is here. And I'm like, cool. All their phones alert a notification that I just posted, and one of them goes, hey, you just posted that on your school account because I worked at a school and I ran social media. And it wasn't anything appropriate, but I shouldn't be posting about my personal life on a school account. So I'm like, oh, oh, this, 30 seconds, I delete it, right, it's gone. So about a week later, I'm sitting in my office and six students come in, this little group that were always together, and they were in my class, and they walk in and they say, we need to talk to you. And they're all sullen and serious. I'm like, oh, okay, what's going on? They walk in, they shut my office door, and they all, they all kind of huddle together. And I'm like, what, what now? What do we, what's, what's the drama that we have to deal with here? And, and one of them looks at me and goes, we want to know why we got benched. <laughs> what? We don't know why we got benched. What are you talking about? And simultaneously, they had rehearsed. They all held their phones up with the picture of me and said, because we're not part of the starting lineup. And they all had the picture. In 30 seconds, they were able to screen capture that. So the whole school probably had my picture. Now, luckily, it wasn't anything inappropriate, and I wouldn't put anything inappropriate on social media. But how fast that can happen, right? So you need to understand, you put something compromising out there, even if it's something that disappears, somebody can grab a hold of it and then spread that information. Um, and then look out for anonymous apps like Whisper, YOLO. I don't even know what YOLO is. It's one of them we're researching. And Kick, there are these messaging apps that are anonymous that are out there. Um, this technology is just growing too fast. Um, 
I got to be honest with you, when I looked at TikTok for the first time, I was terrified as a parent. I was like, this, there's just some really bad content on here. And hopefully that will change over time, but we have to be careful of that. And then some great resources. Um, BraveParenting.net has a really awesome article on social media. And then the, the number one source is commonsensemedia.org. It is a fantastic website for educators, for parents, for students. There's, you could get lost in reading about all of the different things about social media, but it's a fantastic uh, website. And with that, I'll take any last questions, but I'm, I'm wrapped up. Yes, sir. Do you guys give any advice regarding LGBTQ? Thanks. Uh, regarding group chats and WhatsApp, right? So the same rules when, when it comes to screenshotting can apply to all those things. Like, do you guys ever advise, like, hey, you're not, you're not safe if you're posting certain things even within your circle of six or 10 or whatever it is? We haven't grappled with that yet, but yes, that's a, it's a great point, right? That just in the same way these other communication apps, the same thing can happen. And we've had instances of bullying and things like that where that's happened. I think every district has where people are screen capturing things and then showcasing them. Um, but no, that's something we haven't directly tackled yet. Chris. Um, yes. This is fabulous. Thank you very much. You've done a great job presenting this information. Um, yeah, so go ahead. Thank you. I, what I'd like to say is that um, you've given me confidence. I feel I've taken this approach to social media from a parental perspective of I've put threats out there. I've said a lot of things that you've said. I've put my own parameters around how my three children use, you know, social media. But what I'd like to know is, are you, is there any way that this type of information can be put into the schools? You know how we teach them how to do a resume. We teach them how to do career skills and all of that type of thing. Something that can go into the school to show them and teach this, because I, I'm learning that you have to accept it because it is what it is. And and so I've had to embrace it and try to teach my kids the positive stuff. But you've got some good stuff here that I think that they need to know early on. And I, I appreciate the social, the, the, the focus groups and things you're doing. But how can we, is it on the radar to do something a little more formal that it can be a part of their curriculum that they learn? Um, and I don't know how early to do it, but you know, early enough so it could be impactful because this is very good. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. That, it's, it's, we, that's another layer in this work. And so um, the other day I was presenting and I made the, the point that it's only been six months since we've had this, this position. I feel like it's been three years. We've, so much has happened. There's been so much going on and we have so much more to do. And that's a bit, that's totally on our radar. It has been from the beginning. One of the first phone calls I made when I started this position was to the curriculum office to say, hey, what are we doing? And there's some great resources out there. Our librarians are fantastic across the district of mining, really great common sense media articles and different pieces. Um, but it's just a huge piece to tackle. But our vision is starting very, very, very young. You know, when it came to organizing the social media and getting started, we looked at high schools first just because they use it the most and, you know, at their age group, um, right? Because the younger you are, you can't use it or you're not supposed to. So dealing with that, but we are getting to that point. Yes, that's absolutely on the radar. It's just a lot of different conversations and layers to really make that work. And a big piece though is also training our teachers and our staff. You know, it starts with them modeling that work every day in the classroom. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now. We do do a tech summit every year for the district. And so I was just talking to the curriculum office yesterday about that, that we're gonna do another enhanced version of social media training. They've already done it before, but we're gonna continue that work. Thanks. I just wanna follow up what she was saying because um, in 2008, I brought the issue to, to our you know, at camps, because is there's a possibility that we can videotape a teacher when he's t she's teaching a lesson, and especially for students that are absent in the class, and especially the curriculum is so rigid. And if it's a possibility that if they miss a class, they can see it on online exactly what the whole, because one thing is to read about it, but to correlate that reading with the lecture of the teacher, it helps the students really understand the subject matter. Um, but I don't know what are the rules and regulation in that. And the other thing is when it comes to students, they're struggling in classes, what can we do to help them in, in the media way? You know, For example, um, questions. They can post a question and don't know who that student is who posed that question on a particular subject to help each other, you know, um, merge together with, with each other. Because teach, uh, uh, students love to learn from students. And there are, they like to help each other. And by having that concept of always helping each other by answering certain questions in the classroom or a subject that they cannot uh, conceptualize, it's very significant.
Thank you. That's a great comment and great questions. I, there's some privacy rights issues with recording and, and lots of different layers on that. Um, I think we are pioneering that work in not so much in social media, but with Google Classroom and the technology and the Chromebooks we're using in our district is allowing for a lot of that at home interaction. It's, it's just growing and getting better. Um, we are starting to see some of that. I know there's a teacher at, at one of our high schools that does that all the time, post quiz questions and has dialogue with their students, especially right before AP testing starts and things like that. I think the sky's the limit. Um, a fun example that's maybe outside the classroom is last year when Cabrillo High School's uh, soccer team was moving towards winning the state championship. Their uh, players actually, uh, broadcast the game live on Instagram because there's a live feature and so all these thousands of other people got to watch the game so there's, there's a lot of potentials in and out of the classroom we're just getting started with that I think yes I just wanted to piggyback on the other two and just say I really appreciate that you are also showing the positives because my son is in second grade and so far through preschool and and K and first all we've ever heard is the negatives of don't do this, don't let them do this. Well, my I'm from back east, so his entire family, besides his dad and that side of his family, is back there. If we didn't have social media to do FaceTime and things like that, he wouldn't know who his grandpa my parents are. And so it's it's really nice to hear that there are positive things and maybe like for younger kids that might be somewhere to start is you can FaceTime with your family. You can, you know, so where it's you're doing it together with your parents and making it a group experience. Because it's, it, it's really disheartening to have, oh, it's always negative when you know yourself and you're doing it and you're like, it's so positive and there are these positive things to do with it. And a lot of times kids will just, if all you're telling them is the bad stuff that's happening, they don't listen, they, turn, they tune you out. So I really appreciate that you're doing the, showing the positive sides of that too. Absolutely. Thank you for that comment. And, and that's so true. It's, it's, these are tools, whether we like it or not. And a tool can be used for negative, it can be used for positive, but that's a reality. And so what are we doing about that? And that's true. And, it's, and when you start engaging in that positivity, it's amazing to see that we're teaching them appropriately and then we're messaging appropriately. The Long Beach Unified School District is doing as far as like the psychological impact of this for our students. And I have a teenage daughter. And um, I believe that she's uh, s socially stunted in some aspects. Um, I do limit the time, but as far as like t asking her to talk on a phone, she told me, I am psychologically, you know, um, I can't do this. You know, she told me that she had like, anxiety, social anxiety. She diagnosed herself. And I, you know, and so um, I took this serious. Um, and it, I'm actually working with her just to talk on the phone. I mean, you know, like, just this, the, the simplest thing, you know, just calling up for a prescription or something for something, you know. So what is the district, is, uh, is this on there, is there something about this that you're doing as far as like the psychological, mental aspect of this? Uh, definitely. I think across the district, social emotional learning is a huge factor. It's something that leadership really pushes for our, our staff to engage in and training in that work. Um, and then we're looking for more ways to, to add the technical component that social media is, is part of that social emotional concept. So for example, I went out to one of our middle schools and met with their tech coordinator to talk about social media marketing. And they said, hey, we're having some real issues with our students and anxiety. Can you train our teachers on what to look for, look for those negative behaviors and really kind of just be there to mentor so that happens in the classroom. And then also, we're always teaching those 21st century soft skills which are talking on the phone and interfacing and those pieces through our link learning initiative that's a huge part of that um, and so we're doing that I don't think that we I can't I can't give you a here's a plus B plus C, here's everything that we're doing right now but we are moving in that direction definitely I don't have the X number but it's very high um, across the country anxiety rates are, are skyrocketing and some people attribute that to social media but then there's other factors as well but that's part of our social emotional learning is really mentoring our students um, one of our uh, understandings for the district is warm the warm and demanding teacher really that concept of building those deep relationships with students to mentor them while you're instructing and so it's happening I think in every classroom um, throughout the district on that uh, no I mean we've, we've been researching everything to do with social media so we've looked at that um, the there isn't a huge correlation between social media and that when you look at the like when you look at social or suicide rates ex growing in this country there hasn't been a direct link back to social media but there are instances where social media has been a major factor in somebody's decision why um, we're so excited 
um, because this really is a, 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 um, some big new frontier and, and, and I'm so proud of what Chris and Ruth and their department are doing because as a big school district, we really have like just jumped in the deep end of the pool. But the other part though is we as adults need to, to, to model. And so I'm gonna share a pet peeve I have. So when I see parents walking their children in strollers and I see them connected and no one engaging, or I go out to dinner and I see four members of a family and everyone's on a device and there's no talking, I have a huge issue with that because um, some families, mine included, have rules where we say the cell phone goes here and we're going to talk and we're going to interact because there are some social norms that we need to do. So maybe I'm just old fashioned and old, um, but there are certain things I'm really concerned about the younger generation coming up when, you know, because to me, when you, you know, when you walk your child or your grandchild or what it happens to be, that's a beautiful opportunity to explore the nature and explore the world, whatever it happens to be. So we have a huge task in front of us. Um, I just want to personally thank Chris because um, this came from multiple forces. It came from the board initiative. It came from some folks. It came from Chris saying, hey, can I talk to you at Starbucks? Because he knows I drink coffee. And said, hey, I have this wild idea. And we said, interesting. And then I went to the board and said, are you willing to, to, to jump in the deep pool and with us? And because really this is, is a, a blank canvas and we're designing it as we go. So it's, again, thank you, sir. I just really appreciate it. So. I'll leave you with one last thing uh, for your own just research. There's a great book called Digital Minimalism. Right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's a great book called Digital Minimalism. Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. He's an MIT professor. Um, as somebody who does social media all the time, it's helped me find that balance as well. And it's just a great book and really understanding um, how to use the technology properly but not get trapped in it. So it's something, something to check out. Thank you, Chris. Um, so the next piece is the selection process for the new superintendent. If you haven't heard, I announced in um, December that I'm going to retire. So I've had been asked by several parents, um, what's the process going to be? Because the, um, the, the Board of Education, which we have three members here, they, they have really three big jobs. Uh, and I would argue that the number one job is, is hiring and firing the superintendent. And so then they also have to do um, policy development for the district. And then they have to do what we would call fiduciary, which is the budget. Okay? So those are three big, big things. This district has not hired, um, uh, well, in the last 28 years, it's only hired two superintendents. So in its 134-year history of a school system, we have 12 superintendents. I'm the 12th superintendent in the district's history. So the, tw um, the superintendents in Long Beach Unified tend to stay on an average of 10 years. That's uncommon for urban districts. The average is like 3.2 or 3.5. It changes uh, all the time. So I just did a little workshop for a board of um, education in, in an urban district in California that's not too far from here. And they've had, in the last... Um, nine years, five superintendents. That's not good, okay? So it's just not good for people. So, so our board, I gave them a really big task, you know, I mean, talk about homework assignments. So, so, so they, at their last meeting, you can go online, it's archived. You can see a, a great civics lesson and discourse because they have to come up with a process to, to do that. So at our next board meeting, we'll be um, delving more into that process. And so people have asked me, um, what's it going to be like? I, uh, how, what's the process going to be? Well, the board's going to decide this process, and, and that will come soon, um, but it will be a process. And so people have asked me, well, Chris, do you think there will be opportunities for the public to be engaged? Absolutely, and there will be opportunities. So, um, and they will come in multiple forms, um, i.e. this form, and there will be all kinds of things. So the, the great thing that I want to say is this is that you have um, five unbelievably dedicated individuals to education. And they will do, and they do take their job very seriously, and they will do um, it well, and they will listen to all stakeholder groups. Um, but those, are the, those five people are the individuals who select the new superintendent. You know, we live in what's called a representative democracy. You all elect people to do our work, basically, you know. So, you know, um, they will gather input they will, from all stakeholder groups. Um, they will do their job, and then they will select that new superintendent. So my personal goal is that the new superintendent is selected um, by me. <laughs> it's very selfish, <laughs> because I've told the board that I'm, um, I'm, my last day will be June 30th. Okay? Wow. 
So, um, and so the, uh, I always threatened the board that I was going to give them two-week notice. So, the, uh, so um, I wouldn't do that, um, but it's a very hard um, decision when you retire. So for folks who have retired, it's, it's you know, because um, if you love your job, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, I love my job, I'm not tired, I, you know, I have, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. That's another one thing people say, are you sick? You know, what's wrong? <laughs> And I say, do I look that bad? You know, tell me. So, but I, none, of that's, none of that's the case. It's just that the, it's the right time for the system. We're in great fiscal health. We are in um, uh, great relationships with all of our stakeholders. Uh, and by that, I mean our, our governments and, and our, our nonprofits and everybody. We academically, things are moving. I mean, you just saw an example of something, what's going on. Um, you know, this district has more kids probably in preschool than in most districts. It's, it's unbelievable. All positive things. So it's important so that when the new superintendent comes on, that they continue the path, and they will. And, and the beauty of this school system is that this school, this school system is, is known for um, uh, uh, setting the bar high, um, but also known for continuous improvement. And, and that's from the classroom, that's to everything that we do, all the way up to, to, the, um, to the board. And so the next superintendent will come in and just take it to the next 10,000 foot level. And, and that's what it's about, to be really honest with you. And, I, and I'm really selfish because I got two grandkids. And one is uh, 16 months old and one is three months old. So, 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 and hopefully have more coming up. And so, um, but they'll be in school before you know it, you know? And um, so an interesting fact about Long Beach Unified is that 70% of our employees live within our boundaries of our, because we serve four cities, and send their children to our schools. And, and you, we all know, I mean, I always kid people. Um, I had a friend who, who um, graduated from Poly, and, and they had a baby, and, and I said, he already had jackrabbit wear, you know? It's like, you know, it's like, the kid is a day old, and so come on. <laughs> But the beauty is um, that we have a great system. So I share that with you because you'll see the board uh, making a decision about the process, and it will be a process, and there'll be many opportunities for people to be engaged, both in person, electronically, all kinds of things. And the whole part of that process is for, the, for there to be uh, a profile developed on what do you want the next superintendent to do. I actually see it as a visionary statement of um, uh, developing the next um, uh, strategic plan because you know every five years we do a strategic plan and so we always want to build upon that so so um, so more to come about that later because this group obviously um, will uh, hear about that um, Mrs. Ashley raise your hand Mrs. Ashley she's actually been charged with to, to kind of put this together so her homework assignment um, and she's already done it and she's doing it really well well to present the multiple recommendations to the board at the next board meeting um, and then we'll go from there so so the, the uh, but the beauty that we have in our district is that we, um, we do many, many things at the same time. So you know, I always tell people, remember, you can celebrate for two seconds and get back to work and, and for the rest of the hour. So, um, and great things are going on because we have 71,000 kids, K-12, that expect us to work really, really hard each and every day, uh, plus thousands of preschool kids, plus we have um, a couple hundred uh, adults in our program. And that's why these forums are really important because like the information you gave Chris is, is really important because he's gonna take it and go back and, and develop it, you know? And as you heard what he was saying, his student interns, you know, we have a lot of interns right now in the district and they're working behind the scenes with people like Chris and other places to do all this work, you know, it's amazing. Um, we really have, have hired hundreds of our young people and they're doing unbelievable work in all parts of the district, the facilities department, research, my office. We have a, a couple of interns in my office who are going behind the elementary and middle school websites because they don't have a dedicated person and they're actually building and cleaning things up so that we have a common you know, face and so on. Um, so one of the questions that we asked was about online support. So we are actually talking, uh, um, we're piloting a new program right now um, at Avalon and in a, at our high schools, which is actually real-time tutoring. So anytime during the day or evening, it's 24-7, you could type in a question about whatever it is. Content experts are there to answer your question, not to give you the answer, but to give you a, so if this works really well, this is something, again, we would go to the board and say, hey, because um, there's a cost to it, that here's the outcomes, here's what it looks like, 
can we give this to, um, to our kids? It's like what we do with Khan Academy. You know, now Long Beach Unified is one of the few districts that's what they call this um, partnership with Khan, where our kids are just you know, blowing it out of the water, but supporting our teachers to do that. Because we want to make sure that wherever any child is, from the littlest to the oldest, that they can go wherever they want. You know? And so that's the beauty of the system. It will continue, it will con um, and, and go forth. So my promise to you um, on the search process is to make sure that we will keep you abreast um, uh, in person, via email, all these things are what's happening so that everybody knows. On the flip side is we're going to work really hard, okay? So we have work to do. We can't worry about the process. The process is good, it's going to work, and it's going to be fine. So we have work to do. Having said that, you gave me a homework assignment, and it's right here about budgets. So we have them on your paper. It's also in the classroom. So that the, um, this first one is this, this new grant that was given to school districts uh, and, um, last year, and it has to be spent within the next two years. So any school that's listed on this um, page has this money, and I'll tell you why the other ones don't. Um, the, uh, but they have two years to spend this money, and this is for tutoring. Okay? So, and you can see that there are different amounts. The reason there are different amounts is because the, the, the law said that you had to give the money out based on the number of students who did not meet a certain standard on a test. So in this case, if you had more kids who didn't meet the standard, you got more money, okay? So for example, if you look at Avalon, they had $22,000 and it was a per student allocation. So you can see where Bixby only got 14,000 because um, it, didn't, it had fewer students who fell into that category. So the, um, these are all basically schools who are not Title I, okay, for the most part, and because that's where the law separated it out. Now remember in this district what we've done is that every single school in this district, whether you're on this list or not, has money for tutoring. So the schools who are not on this list actually have um, huge Saturday programs. So for example, Adams and, and um, all Title I schools, all the big high schools, even the small high schools are running Saturday programs. So there really is no reason for a student not to get the help he or she needs and the remedial side, but also on the acceleration side. Because what we've directed our schools to do is yes, offer support for you know, help, but also offer support for what we call fun, extracurricular. And it's all over the map from robotics to dance to music to whatever happens to be. So, so every single school in this district, all 84 buildings have resources some are doing it after school, some are doing it after school on Saturday, some are doing Saturday school. And then the Title I schools, as well as all the high schools, run um, summer programs. And so we call it SEAL. So it's an enrichment program. And even in that program, it is um, uh, remedial and enrichment. And this year, um, we just met, was it Tuesday, Jill? Yeah, so I, it's so busy, it's forgetting. Um, last year, we restricted the, um, the, the Title I program. So, for example, if I was at Adams, it was for third, fourth, and fifth graders. If I was in middle school, it was for sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. This year, it's going to be for anyone who's post-K, which means I just left kindergarten, to post-4, so basically K-5. And then for the um, middle school, it will be six, seven, and eight. So we expanded it for that program. And again, in the, middle, in the high school, it's, it's huge. Uh, and some of the high schools, to be really honest with you, ran it the traditional s program. Some did it in August before school started. They have great flexibility on what to do and how to do it. It's very, very exciting. And so, so I share that with you so that with, as, as you go back to your sites, you can ask those questions, okay? So if you look at the next page, these are just the, all these budgets for this year. We always give lottery money to schools, so you can see how much your school had, how much they didn't spend from last year. Don't get mad at them if you see they didn't spend money. There could be a real good reason for that. Um, and then this year, if you look at this third column where it says ETK, TK, and K, we gave each teacher in, uh, who taught 
uh, early transitional kindergarten, transitional kindergarten or kindergarten, $500 to buy materials for their classroom. So it was whatever they felt was appropriate. It could be blocks, it could be you know, a rug, for, you know, whatever it happens to be. So, and then you can see the total. If you look at the next one, it's still unrestricted, but that one's for middle school and K-8. These are all online too. And then the high school is this one. High school is a little different because high school has very specific um, departments. So for example, in art, we give them money for art so they can buy the clay, they can buy the ceramics, they can buy that. You should not, and I will say this again, you should not be getting something from one of our schools that says, please give me $10 to buy clay or any of that stuff, okay? You are not, and I'm going to say this again, you are not required to pay for any of that stuff. If you want to make a donation to stuff, that's up to you. But the schools have money. So for example, if you've got a request like that, you go back to that school and say, hey, I know you have X for art, and you didn't spend it, so it's, it's right here. <laughs> so music's the same way. We had a high school a couple years ago that went to its PTA and said, we need uh, $5,000 for sheet music, because you have to pay copyright, you know? And I told that PTA, don't do that, you know? Because that particular school has money in its music to pay for sheet music. Use your $5,000 for something else. So the same for science. Science also has a lot of material needs. So those types. Of, and then there's the, what we call general. The next one is, um, this is a, an account that we do. Um, this year we gave, it's called LCSF Performance Incentives. This is money for schools who um, hit certain targets in our, our strategic plan uh, and make growth. So this year, just um, to give you a heads up, we gave um, $1.3 million out to schools for various issues. This is what, this money can be used for anything that the school deems necessary that's going to help that school on its mission to serve children, okay? This money, again, doesn't go away. It's not robbed by Mr. Steinhauser at the end of the year. So, so, the, so well, actually, no, I won't be here to rob it, so. <laughs> so the next one is a... Um, and we probably should blow this up in a different way, Lori. Um, it's uh, money for athletic replacement. So at the high school level, um, things such as football helmets and wrestling mats and things need to be replaced on a regular basis because of health issues, you know, and, and safety. So, um, and schools have other accounts too, but we, um, a concern that came from them was that they needed extra money. So they have particular money for that. So that's only, and it has to be spent both on boys and girls sport. It cannot only be spent on boys football. It's not the way it to be. So you can see, again, this district is very good about allowing schools to carry over money and so that you have the next going. If you look at the next account, which is green, it says LCFF student-wide uh, support. Again, this is based on the number of kids uh, that qualify who are either English language learners, who are on free and reduced lunch, or who are foster children, and it's at $55 per uh, child. And so you can see um, the different amounts. And again, if they um, have a carryover amount, they, um, so again, don't beat them up if there's a large carryover. There could be a really good reason for that. I, I actually beat people up, so don't, don't worry about that part. So that, um, but don't, please don't do that. If you look at the next one where it says it's blue, it says LCFF College and Career Readiness Funding. This is money that we actually give to our schools at the high school level to support things um, in the summer to help with the AP program. So for example, I've never taken AP biology before and the school is gonna have a, an enrichment program in the summer for me. Or it's going to do a, um, uh, an orientation program to, for all ninth graders coming in. Um, also all high schools, as you well know, are in pathways. So each pathway of the high school has a particular amount of money based on its own kids. So a larger pathway, so for example, the arts pathway at Wilson has 750 kids. It would have more money than maybe the WAVE, which has maybe 500 kids. So it's based by number of students. The teachers of that particular pathway decide on how that money is spent to support the kids of that pathway. Okay, so for example, at McBride, which has three pathways, they have money for the engineering, for the health, and the law. 
So it's because people said, I need money for field trips, I need money for X or whatever happens to be, it could be a speaker coming in, all those things. So again, this is new, this started a couple years ago, but you can see um, this year there's around almost $650,000, uh, again, for, that, for those pathways to do what they need to do, okay? And then the next one, which again, we probably should change, it's too small. This is one of my favorites. This is a student advisory committee. And they, have, they struggle to spend their money. They go, do you know how hard it is, Mr. Steinhauser, to make these decisions? Uh, they go, our ideas are this big, but you've given us this much money. And I said, yeah, it's really hard. We have to make choices. So, um, they, uh, so I meet with them on a regular basis, but this is their money to spend again by their decision on what would um, make their school better. And I'll tell you, the number one thing that they choose to spend it on are culture and climate issues. So for example, at Wilson, they said, you know, we really want to up our game. And so they bought all these um, benches and games. And, and, and I thought, this is kind of interesting. How many kids are really going to you know, use this? You go at lunchtime, and you'll see kids playing these games, uh, cornhole and all these other games. It's very exciting to see. And so again, their choice, what they wanted to have engagement um, in, as they've talked to their, their colleagues. Then the next one is the Title I. And in, in this district, um, Title I only goes to schools who are 75% or higher in free and reduced lunch. Years ago, it used to go all the way down to schools that were 40% because that's the law. But we've lost about $15 million and we can no longer do that um, or our programs would be totally watered down. And so what the law says is that you have to fund every school that's 75% or higher before you can fund anybody else. And remember in Title I, there is a requirement in the Title I program for Title I parent involvement, so it has its own, what I call, set-aside. Um, and then we do have set-aside money for other schools to do that too. Um, uh, any questions about these budgets? Yes, um, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, one minute. And then we'll go over it here, so. Here and then over there, okay, go ahead. Going back to the LCFF Student Advisory Committee, um, who specifically on campus holds those funds? Is it ASB? No. So oh. the, 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 the schools have student uh, leaders that come to meet with me, and then those student leaders go back to their site and work with the staff member. It might be the ASB advisor, it might be a, um, the pathway person, and then they hold their own forms of how to spend that money. They have a very simple sheet that they fill out and send it directly to me. They share that information with the principal, but the school adults don't have a right to veto what the decision is. So I do. Um, um, for example, one school wanted to buy a food truck. I go, we can't buy a food truck, guys. <laughs> Sorry. Every year they want a food truck, so, so, so we can't do that. But um, what we do is at our meetings, we share what we're doing and we share those ideas amongst all the students. So, so for example, the EPHS, EPHS students wanted to have, uh, again, it was a culture climate issue. They wanted to improve their signage and they wanted to improve, um, so they had murals painted, they had big signs painted because they really wanted to enhance their presence. And so, and, and they, the next piece, they supported their college and career center. So they really wanted some new things in, in their college and career center. So it's those kind of ideas. So in some cases, um, they have actually um, um, picked certain programs at the school or certain departments that they wanted to do. So, so for example, one school said, you know, we really need a, a better mobile PA system so we can do all kinds of things for engagement purposes. So we said, uh, um, uh, as long as it's going to be appropriate, and they, it's very simple. They tell me the what, the why, and how much it's going to cost. So, you know, and that's where it really gets kind of tricky, because they get, they go, the what is like this long, you know, and the why is really good, but then the, the, the money doesn't equal what they have, you know, so it, it's very interesting. So when a particular school is asking f uh, p uh, money, parents to pay for things, I wonder if those teachers are aware that there's 
funds available before all they these ask. on board and we share that um, I share the, this information with all the I go every year to the teacher rep council from Long Beach Unified so who are the teachers of the union who are representing all the schools I give them all the budgets I give everybody all the budgets so the questions that people need to ask are going back to their own site councils going back to whatever process they use to do that so Items that is not mentioned here some of the school they need to uh, replenish their um, kit you know emergency kit is that so that's a great question so a couple of years ago the board allocated money and we actually spent about five hundred thousand dollars system-wide and replenished all kinds of materials at the school we are actually um, coming back because we just did it was probably four years ago I think we did or five and so um, we just did another survey of all the um, earthquake kits and it's going to cost probably about $200,000. So we are coming back to the board um, to ask for about $150,000 um, uh, because we have $50,000 in a special uh, grant that's just for safety. Um, and that will be done. So those things, um, all the basics are there. And it's based on formulas, all that kind of stuff. So the, um, the uh, parents are not supposed to donate for you, that particular Schools will, you, you don't have to, but schools, like even when I was a principal, we asked our parents to donate so we could add things to it and do more. So, so schools can do that, that's not a problem, but we will have the basics for all the schools and all the kids. The other piece is that in our school, in our cafeterias, we have enough food to serve um, all the kids for three days because those are the standard practices, water, all that kind of stuff. So we have the basics, all that for every, some people may want more of whatever, which they can go to their parents. Um, the schools um, don't even know about this next piece yet because we just actually talked about it about two weeks ago. And again, my job is to find resources. Um, I have to take it to the board to get their approval. I'm sure they'll be fine, um, but it's that type. But we do on a regular basis survey. And the beauty is that we, we know the life shelf of these things, you know, the shelf life. And then, because some things, so for example, right now, I think we have to replace 30 of the cargo containers because they're leaking and they're old and, you know, and they cost like $2,500 a part, you know, so. Hi, I wanted to ask, um, when our campus is being used for other things such as filming or, you know, hosting uh, athletic events for other schools or for the community, and um, where does that money go to? Great, great question. So um, I'm going to break it into two pots. So the first pot would be film money, okay? So we, our schools are used um, a lot for filming. That money, there's a, a portion that goes to pay for the folks that have to be there. So that comes off the top. Then there's 10% um, uh, that goes into a district account. And then the bulk goes into the school account, into the gift account. Film money is what we, I call free money. So free money can be used for a variety of things. So for example, high schools have a lot of filming going on. So you might see a high school giving out Starbucks cards and this and that. We are not allowed to give out taxpayer, uh, we can't use your money to give out what's called a public good, okay? We can't give a gift. But we can use free money because it's not taxpayer dollars. And so you'll see that. So, so schools will do that. Now there's another pot of money which is called community use permit. So for example, there are probably 30 of our schools or maybe more that are used, um, uh, and we have thousands of these permits, uh, but churches use our schools on a regular basis because it's very cost effective, you know, use the auditoriums, that's legal. The difference is that they have to, um, they pay a rental fee, again, they pay for the, someone to be there because we have to have someone there, um, and then that money goes to the school, to the, so again, it goes back to the school. So, so I would ask, because every some schools don't ever get used, to be really honest with you. Some schools don't get used. Some schools, I mean, we have to turn away the work because we can't, you know, it's just, you can only have so many people there at a given time. If it's a school district event, we're not making any money. So, so we're paying for the, you know, the custodian or the teacher or the athletic event. That's not going to, you know, be. Um, athletic events at the high school, that money, if there's any profit, goes back to the ASB. So that's controlled by the ASB. So for example, football games, basketball games, and so on. So, but I would ask your, your um, and you know what? Where's Lori? 
So Lori, um, we probably, we could do this for you at the next one. We could give you the, the schools, um, uh, uh, what the schools have in what we call the, the gift account, because that's the film money, and the community use permit piece. We can give that out. So, because that's, as, as stakeholders, when you're looking at fiscal decisions, you need to really look at um, the whole, um, you know, piece of the pie, so to speak, as you're looking at how to spend money and so on. So, yes, over here. Did you say the low-performing student? I hate that term, but yes, yeah, it's called the low-performing block grant. Was that because for the state test that they did? Yeah, it was all based on SBAC, so it was only given to um, students in grades 3 through 8 and grade 11. Oh, okay. So... However, the money can be used for any student in elementary, great K-5, or it could be used for students in, in high school, 9-12. So it was, even though it's only allocated for that, that's what the school gave. It was a state, it was a state piece. Uh, I just noticed that at CAMS that there was a leftover of 6800 and then they gave them a budget of the same. Because um, when I was there, the students, they would like to have um, water fountain that they can refill bottles is that you couldn't spend there's certain you have to be careful so there's certain money for example we have had students um, take some of their student uh, advisory money and buy water filling stations we've had that um, we um, we have to be careful though because um, there's a standard so you you can't just go out and buy a water filling station and then say it's going to get you know put in because we had that happen. A school bought a water filling station and it cost like $10,000 to put it in. Well, you can't, it's big, and there's, there's rules and stuff. So you do need to know that through Measure E, when the schools go under their um, air, uh, air conditioning and modernization, there are water filling stations being put in every building, I mean every school plant, either two to three, it depends on the school, um, and the other schools who are, are already air conditioned will get those too. So just like every classroom is getting you know, the overhead, they're getting these water filling stations too. Now a school could choose to, to supplement that and, and we have approved those, um, but that just comes to us. We have to, but you couldn't use tutoring money to buy a watering station. So you could use other money. So that's, yeah. Was there a question over here? Uh -huh. so the, okay. So open forum now. Who, who has a question? Yes, sir. Kind of uh, alluded to, or you actually addressed this a little bit, uh, free public education, because it seems for me, for, well, for me, I've I've had discussions with both Fremont and Tincher now, the schools my son has gone to, about this, um, and you kind of talked about schools can take donations, yep, but they can't mandate that students pay when it's a mandatory activity. My question is, it seems like both of my son's schools did a poor job, even though Tensure seems to be approving this, about letting parents know that, you know, there's this field trip, we're asking for a $50 donation, but we want to make it clear that no child will be denied participation. Right. What I've seen is they ask for the donation, sometimes they use the word donation, sometimes they don't, but they don't let the parent know that second little part, like, hey, if you don't pay, your, your child still gets to know. Has that been made clear? Oh, yeah. To so, but to teachers, because it seems like principals kind of know it, but then the teacher uh, sends out the field trip form, and then you have to go complain, and they're like, oh, they made a mistake. We'll, well do it next uh, year. Right. And so I have 10,000 employees. Okay. <laughs> so I can't guarantee on any given day that everyone's going to follow the rules. However, I appreciate what you just said because when I meet with our folks, in our teacher councils, in our, in, our super, in, our, in our principal meetings, I share these examples. And so, um, and so when, um, and what I would really appreciate is when you get one of the flyers, because um, this happened, someone said, you're required to do X. I, I'll, I'll give you a prime example, it just happened this year. So one of my high schools, to, will not be named, because I have 14, um, sent home this thing that said, um, parents, you're this is for freshman orientation, you're required to do A, B, C. And I'm like, wow. And so the parent gave me the packet. And right there it said A, B, and C. So I called up the school and said, um, you know you can't do this. And they go, oh, we didn't change that. 
you know? And I said, well, guess what's going to happen? And this is a big school. I said, you're going to send a new packet out immediately to all 900 people. And if people have given, it was a request for 50 bucks. And if people have given that 50 bucks, you're going to rebate, uh, rebate that 50 bucks ASP. So, and they did. So it's, again, knowledge, because in this particular case, a new person came on, and he was using old um, flyer information, you know. So it's, it's just fine, and, and it's all good. But I appreciate that parent, you know. They go, well, don't use my name. I go, I'm not going to use anyone's name. Because, <laughs> you know, people don't want, um, but the thing is, we um, all have to work together. Now, the sad part is, is our schools are underfunded. You know, that's just honest truth. A prime example is, uh, the governor just came out with his new budget, and I'll give you those things next time. But we're getting $3 million worth of new money next year, okay? A school district our size. That's not a lot. My, my costs are going to be um, $21 million, my fixed costs. So that means that I'm going to have a problem of $18 million. That's not good. You, know, you don't want that kind of problem. So um, the, the beauty that we have in this district is that we do have some healthy reserves that can get us through. But I'll be honest with you, um, there, you're going to start reading in the paper about school districts laying off teachers. Um, Manhattan Beach just had a meeting um, uh, um, this week, um, the very small school district, um, and they have a parcel tax, which means that their parents pay more. They have a foundation that gives them six and a half million dollars. So they are looking at a three million dollar deficit that they're going to have to lay off people. This is a very small school district, you know. Um, and you can see all this funding that they have, that the, and that's to keep at their minimum reserve. And the minimum reserve is 3% for the school district. It's very small. Our minimum reserve here in Long Beach Unified is 2%, which is $19 million. My monthly payroll is $46.5 million a month. So my minimum reserve would only pay for not even two weeks of pay for my teachers. So, so those are the things that keep a superintendent up. And so, so the thing is, you're gonna hear about West Contra Costa. They're facing a $40 million deficit, and they, which means they have to cut this money. San Diego, which cut money uh, and laid off teachers a couple years ago, has to do the same thing this year. They're facing a $70 million deficit this year for next year, and then they're gonna have to cut another 40 million the following year. I'm here to tell you that's not going to happen here. So even with you know, me leaving, it's not going to happen in the next couple years. Uh, and the reason is because the board has made it clear that we're going to have health reserves. We're going to continue to enhance services for our young people. But we're going to do it in a very strategic and methodical good way. We all have to lobby and, 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 and encourage lawmakers to, to fund our school systems because um, you know, I'm a um, firm believer in public education as the backbone of this democracy, and, um, but you can't go on if you don't have money, you know? And so, so it's um, the one sad notice I'll tell you for me as a superintendent is that I will be, up to, to this point, the only superintendent in this district's history who's ever laid anybody off. Wow. In this district's history, there have never been a superintendent who has laid off massive layoffs, like, you know, that we're talking about. So I will, that's not a good thing that you want to be known for. But we had to do it in order to keep ourselves stable and not go into bankruptcy. Because when you go into bankruptcy, the district, the board loses all of its authority. The superintendent is fired and the CBFO, which is the financial person, is fired. So because what they do is they send a person in to, to basically control your district. So, so that will never happen here um, for a variety of reasons, which is good. But um, we, one of the promises I made to the board, that under my watch, you, I would never put them in that situation ever again. You know, I probably lost 10 years of my life, to be honest with you, during that time, because we had to go up to 10 years of service to, to and, and remember I told you how many people live in our city? 70%. So some of those people, both husband and wife, partners got laid off. I mean, this is really, really bad. So we have been very strategic about how we spend our money, what we do, why we do it, and great things are going on for kids, you know? We have more kids in music than ever and all these fun things. Look at your, your one to one Chromebooks. How many people got a Chromebook uh, this year? All right, good, 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 good. That's fun, fun. I can't tell you how many kids emailed and said, oh, thank you so much, this is cool, so.
Question. Um, I just have a question on um, family engagement. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been talking with my school site council and in Head Start we're really big on family engagement that's a really huge part and we're, we're really good at it but to get that those conversations started with them at the elementary level it's like we have money for family engagement why aren't we doing things well it, and I get a litany of well we can't do this or we can't do this I'm like okay but what can we do like I want to want you to stop telling me what we can't do and let's work on what we can invite do. invite me out to your next meeting <laughs> Yeah, because it's like we, it, it's always a, a, a thing about we don't get it more parents involved. We can't get parents to come to things. And I'm like, we, we can, we can, but they, yeah. No, so. no, seriously, invite me out and I'll, okay. call, I'll call your, your site person and, and we'll go from there. So the, um, cause when I was a principal, I had the same issue. People, you know, um, it took some work to be really honest with you, but we got it. Yes, sir. Thanks, Chris. Um, what explains that gap between Sacramento and Long Beach, like, has the governor explained how it's possible to have such a big gap, like millions of dollars unaccounted for when it comes to funding our so, school So, for example, for us, the, um, our money comes, you know, as you all well know, from the state. So we're getting what's, uh, the COLA is 2.29 um, uh, next year. So 2%. Um, so just to give you an example, um, where $13 million of the um, fixed cost is. So just in um, our health benefit increase costs, which we have a, um, a cap here in the district, so we, it, we're only required to pay so much, you know? So it's 3.5%. Um, and then our, our STIRS, which is a retirement for teachers and uh, anyone who's like me, a certificated person, and um, our PERS, which is a classified employee, those costs are gonna go up um, just between the healthcare and the retirement costs are gonna go up $13 million next year. So what happens for school districts is that we have to pay, as an employee, I pay 10% of my, my monthly fee uh, check goes into my retirement. The state puts in a chunk from the state level, and then the district puts in, so right now the district puts in 16.1% of the salary. It used to be eight. So it's doubled in the last couple of years. It's gonna go to 19%. So, so every year, just based on that, for teachers, I know that my fixed costs are eight million dollars. Then for classified, it's a little different formula, um, but it's going to go right now. It's about twenty percent. It's going to go to twenty-seven percent. So we, we as a school system, know the schedule. It's like your credit card payment. You know, you know the schedule. So we know the schedule. We've planned for the schedule. Okay. So utility costs go up a couple million dollars because. Water goes up, electricity goes up. Now what we've done to, to kind of combat some of that cost are our solar projects. We have 21 new solar projects going in the, in the system to help lower those costs. So we have what I call fixed cost. You know, you have healthcare, you have salaries. We, um, in the district, um, employees move over on the pay scale and that's about a $2 million cost, okay? So I have these fixed costs, but the state's only giving me $3 million of new money, but it's saying, hey, Mr. Steinhauser, you're going to pay for all these increased costs. It's your, it's your issue. Megan. So that doesn't include any unfunded mandates that the legislature has <laughs> exactly. passed in terms of um, like the school start time bill that will happen in a couple years. They've, they've made a mandate on school start times, but have given no money to support districts in um, addressing the dollar amount that that will cost. And so that's millions of dollars for a school district like ours. So they Absolutely. say do it, but they don't give any money. So that's the, also something to consider. I'm so glad the state makes these rules. And I, whenever I go to Sacramento, I say, please, no more laws. Because every time there's another problem for us, and, and, but there's no, there's no, you know, you gotta do X. The other part that you just need to know is, we, we have always hovered between 69 and 70% poverty. This year was the first time we dropped to 67.2, which means that that was about an eight to $10 million drop in funding. So, so we, we're not exactly positive that's right. And, and that comes from a couple different things. Kids turning in their applications, you know. So we want everyone to turn in applications for, for lunch whether you qualify or not, because we need this accurate information. That's why that census data is so important. Everyone has to fill out the census because it's so important for so many things. 
So, um, but having said that, you know, w we in this district have worked really hard to make sure that our systems are in place so that we can catch these things. So we have budgeted out all these fixed costs. We have budgeted these things out. And that's why I'm known as Mr. No, you know, I say no to a lot of things because they're not that I don't want to do it, it's just that I can't, um, you know, fund it. And I don't want to give you something, have to take it away. I think it's so unfair to the kids. So, yeah. so yes, Jerlene. Because you forgot to announce something. <laughs> What? <laughs> On February 1st, just wanted to- Oh, I'm um, sorry, thank you so much. <laughs> um, everyone probably should have received a text message from the district yesterday, uh, save the date, um, but I wanted to make sure that you all are reminded that on February 1st from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. there is going to be oh, yeah. a local control accountability plan community forum. This is going to be number three um, uh, of the, the, the third one taking place. It's going to be at Cabrillo High School. It is a forum that is planned by community stakeholders, parents, and the district. So I know we go into a lot of stuff uh, about budget and funding here. This will be an opportunity to go deep, uh, to go more in depth and ask a few more questions. There's gonna be a panel made up of parents and district personnel available to answer questions and so we, and we can also come together and strategize on how funds are directed to our young people. Thank you. And thank you, Jerlene. And um, we're all, we'll make sure that people also get reminders. But we're going to be live streaming that meeting. So, so for example, like you heard Mr. Itzen talk about the parent forum where only 50 people showed up, but 2,000 people watched it. That could be the situation where maybe 300 people show up, but 3,000 people watch it. And the beauty of live streaming, I was at church about a, two weeks ago, and this parent came up to me and said, I just want to thank you for live streaming those parent university pieces because I couldn't go to that event, but this really helped me with my child. And, and, and you know, um, she didn't number one, she didn't need to do that, but it's pretty exciting to that she saw the, the power of that. So, and remember, it's archived. So if you can't even see it live stream, you can go back and watch it again. So we're gonna pull out some, um, double check your, um, your seats that you have your ticket. So does everybody have their ticket? We have some prizes up here, and they're all really healthy prizes. So, for so. <laughs> so um, there's a chocolate, a lot of candy, movies, uh, tickets, and candy, and then two different cakes. I highly recommend um, if you go to to the movies. There is um, there are two great movies out. Uh, there's a lot of great movies out, but um, um, two that I think are highly in, in, um, impactful for all of us and for our young people. One is uh, Just Mercy. Uh, many of our kids are reading that book in their pathway classes. It's a great movie about social justice and so on. And, um, uh, and the other one is Harriet. If you haven't seen the movie Harriet, it's a huge successful movie on the, the life of Harriet Tubman. And I just think if I had my way, every kid would have to watch that. Um, yeah, but I'm not the king of the world, so. The, um, so I think so, yeah, yeah. The, um, if I, I'm trying to think, oh, absolutely, I think it would be fine. So the, uh, um, the first one is 602, 602, okay. <laughs> Whatever you choose. The next one is 614. Oh, yeah, yeah, you take the whole thing. <laughs> Six six one four six one four. Come on down. The next one is wow. This is interesting. Six one seven six one seven. All right. Next. Wow. This is crazy. I'm I am shaking them up, guys. The next one is six one six six one six. Whoa. Five eight eight. 588, 588, all right. 600, 600. Okay. 610, 610. All right. You have to tell me how this is. This looks really good. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye, guys.